Welcome to another episode of Go With The Flow. As always, a very special guest in the building. I've been telling you that I was going to get you on the podcast for a very long time. I bet you never believed me, but I always told you in due time and things would always would always happen. Cool. But my friend Grace is in the building. Welcome to the show, Grace. Thanks for having me. Of course. And so the way that I start every single episode, I always tell my guests to introduce themselves, tell me where they're from, stuff they do around campus, and then just any other general introduction that they would want the people to know. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm a junior. Technically, I took a gap year, so I low-key should be in the class of 2022. You're an o- OG 2022. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm uh, from Long Island, uh, majoring in um, African American Studies. I'm getting a certificate in American Studies. Um, and I'm on the women's basketball team. Um, and I guess the other major thing that I do on campus is I'm the president of the Black Student Athlete Collective. Um, and yeah, that really takes up literally all of my time. So that's what I do. And okay, Black Student Athlete Collective. I did want to ask you about that. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, so BSAC sort of came out of uh, you know, the spring of 2020 and everything that kind of happened um, with the murder of George Floyd and then Breonna Taylor. Um, I think that that was a period, especially because, you know, we were all home for COVID, that I was just got pretty contemplative. I was like, what is my Princeton experience been like as a black athlete? And I talked to other black athletes and, um, you know, we sort of bonded over the fact that we thought that the department could be doing a better job of supporting us. Um, and we wanted to build community with one another. We realized we hadn't really done that. Um, and so, yeah, Black Student Athlete Collective is really just more of a space and a community than anything else of just, like, Black student athletes getting to know each other, sharing our experience, and figuring out ways, you know, to make it better for ourselves, but also for, you know, future Black student athletes at Princeton. And that was something that you founded, or did it already exist? No, there wasn't really anything um, that existed uh, beforehand. Uh, There was a black men's group um, that was basically um, black male student athletes. But other than that, um, there was really nothing like it beforehand. And it was me and sort of a few other black student athletes that co-founded BSAC. And uh, we have been working on it ever since. Name, name, shout them out. Who was it? (laughs) Oh, my God. I love my people. You don't have to tell me twice. Um, So it was me, my guy, Alex Charles, president, I think, of Charter. Charter, yeah. Yes, Um, He's great. He um, was there from the beginning. Quincy Monday, who is... Shout out, Quincy. Wrestling superstar. He is a star. (laughs) Um, He has stuck with me this whole entire time. Um, And then there are a few who have graduated. Obi, um, I don't know if you remember her. She was on the track team. Yeah. Um, she's incredible. She helps so much. Um, I don't know if you remember, I don't know if you know any rowers, but this girl, Ashley, who, who graduated. She was in TL, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm forgetting her last name, but she. Scott? I think Ashley Scott. I think so. Yeah. I think. I might uh, be making that up. I hope it's Scott. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but she was a huge part of it as well. Um, and I'm, I'm forgetting people, but like, those are kind of like the go-tos. Lola Constantino on fencing. She has been there. Mike Rutland football. Um, even Nina Young, you know, my teammate on basketball, she's been there since the beginning. So just like a, an incredible group of black student athletes who we all felt like, you know, we could be doing better and we could be doing more. So, yeah, love that. Love that group. And since you guys have created this club, how would you say that it's in- impacted and, and, and improved your experience here at Princeton? As I think, a black student athlete. Yeah, I think it just it's built connections. Like I, I never knew Quincy or Alex before this. I never knew Lola. I didn't really have a relationship with Mike in any way. And it's connected me first and foremost to other black student athletes. But I think, you know, it's been tough to try to build that community. I think we've had events and we're still trying to figure out ways in which like structurally that we can, you know, most benefit all the black student athletes. But I think that like a lot of the work that we've done has been in the department Um, on that end. We've been major components of, you know, the Tigers together initiative that the athletic department created in 2020 um, with a focus on, you know, anti-black racism and trying to combat that. And 
you know, we've been a part of discussions about hiring practices and we've been a part of discussions surrounding hiring um, a position for diversity, um, you know, discussing DEI uh, training within the department, um, you know, sort of like those fundamental structural things within the department um, that we see could be better. Um, and so I think that that's kind of been our, you know, biggest accomplishment is, is trying to get the department to listen to the student athletes. Um, and I think, you know, they've, they've done a pretty good job thus far. Okay. And cause you're out, you just answered my question. I was about to say, have they actually been listening and have they actually been responsive to the different things that you guys have been trying to bring up to them? I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, being an African-American studies major, like I see, you know, you see throughout time how systems can either, you know, suppress voices or empower them um, and how structurally it takes a long time and it takes like decades or, you know, even longer to sort of actually change a system. Um, and so I think that, you know, so far, you know, the, it, the department hasn't been perfect, but I think that they've they've done what they can. And I think that this is something that over time is going to have to change. It's not something that's really going to manifest itself, really, in my my time at Princeton or even in the next 10 years, but hopefully and beyond, if you keep doing the work, if you keep, you know, something like BSAC in place, you know, it actually does change. Yeah, exactly. And I think, because I, I, I can relate to that. When I was on the board of PBMA and PASA, all these different whatever organizations, you want immediate changes for whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, but then at a certain point you realize things do take time. It's yeah. not. It's probably not going to be accomplished while you're here, and you just have to hope that there's going to be people you could just hand the baton to, and then they just keep the good work going, and that that's that's really all you can hope for. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's always been just sort of my hope is that I just kind of – I just want to empower other people to, just, like, speak up. I think, like, for me, like, BSAC came out of me being really scared yeah. and then, like, <laughs> speaking up and being like, oh, my God, I don't know what people are going to say. Like, I'm so – I don't – I've never talked about this. Like, and then, you know, finally doing it because I had support. So – um, yeah, I think that's that's really all I want out of BSAC. Word, okay. Um, and so transition a little bit, like you said, you said your BSAC and then women's basketball, which takes up the majority of your time here as a student athlete. And so I want to first take it back to your OG sophomore season mm -hmm. when you're still 2022 pre-COVID. And so that year you guys were 27 and one. You had one loss in overtime. And you had Bell Allery, top five draft pick for the WNBA. And then your season gets disrupted by COVID. And so that was a season where you guys were world beaters. You were on track to who knows how far you guys were going to go. Tell me, take me back to when you found out that your season was ending and exactly the emotions that you were going through, especially in consideration of the fact that you guys were having such a great season. Yeah, I, it's crazy to, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about that moment, especially in my COVID year when I was just kind of like by myself and, <laughs> you know, there's, there's not much to, you know, think about or dwell on. And I, I, it's hard because it came in stages. Mm -hmm. Um, it was like, oh, the Ivy tournament's canceled, but like you guys are going to get a bid for like the NCAA tournament. So like the guy season had ended, you know, because, like, they weren't really going to the – like, they didn't know if they would go to the NCAA tournament. You know, they wouldn't get, like, any kind of automatic bid. Um, and so it was like, that's ending. Okay. And then it was like, oh, no, the NCAA tournament's not happening. <laughs> you're going home. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're leaving. <laughs> and so that – I remember, like, we – our coach gathered us um, in a room – in our team room and – told us and I just remember sitting there just like absolutely stunned and it didn't even feel real um I, I didn't know what to do with myself I remember looking around the room and then you know our coach is trying to make it feel better you know she's trying to say like it's okay like I'm so proud of the work we did this season and and like nobody else would speak and then somebody would speak up and say something nice and I just remember I just remember saying that like I don't think I physically could go through anything like this with any other group of people and like I I started crying and I was just like I you know this this team has meant more to me than like any of you guys will ever know because like we've been through adversity together we've been through you know the trenches together um and you know it's sad because nothing's ever going to feel like this again but like this was the best that I'm ever going to get you know and this is you know as as good as it gets for me and so it's like you kind of have to take solace in that, I think. Um, 
but it's still scary. And it's like, it still was like, oh my God, what's happening? You know, this is still a virus we didn't know a lot about. And it, it was just, a, it was a mixed emotion of feelings, but like, you know, I think gratefulness was probably up there for me when I was, when that was all happening. Why, why gratefulness? Um, I think I just, you know, I was grateful for the season that we had. Like I knew that um, we had worked so hard for that season. Like that season wasn't easy. You know, people think that, you know, we just went out and won a bunch of games yeah. and we had this crazy <laughs> loss and then we won a bunch of games again. And it's like, people don't really get, you know, the grind and like, that was our first year with our new head coach and like nobody knew what that would look like. Nobody had any idea what was going to happen and everyone bought in. Like everyone said, I want to be a part of this and I want this to be something really special. And it was. And so I think that, you know, even though it was take, taken from us, excuse me, it was taken and, and it was scary, but you know, we had something incredible and you know, that, that team was so special um, and so, yeah, I, I was just like, that, you know, this sucks, but like, I'm going to have that with me forever, you know? Yeah. And you just touched on, I was going to ask about it later, but you just touched on it. You said that it was your first season with a new head coach. So what could you ex explain exactly, um, what, so your the, your initial head coach that you came in with left after freshman year. Yeah. Okay. And so at that point in time, could you explain exactly how, getting a new head coach affected the team was it something that was very significant or was it something where it was like okay this is the new situation we have and we're just gonna keep going well I think that you know especially in women's basketball I think that more people realize that in men's basketball because you know some top programs have so many one and dones and they don't go through the college experience and you don't have the same people or the same coach for four years um you know that our head coach, Coach Banghart, who's now at UNC, like, she recruited me. You know, she saw something in me from when I was young. I've had a relationship with her since, you know, and I went to, like, Princeton camp. So I've, I've known her a very long time. Um, and so, you know, I've grown up with that that woman, basically. And she, she wanted me to come here. And um, so losing a head coach like that, like, losing that relationship is never insignificant. And I think that, you know, was the same across the board for everyone. And so... And, you know, you don't even only lose the head coach. You lose the entire staff most of the time. Um, and so, you know, it was really scary to to have that happen. And, and it's something that you never – I never imagined happening in my four years. And so um, there's just, you know, this level of, okay, what – what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and then it's like, okay, well, we don't really have time to worry about what, what's going on. You know, we, we don't really have time to be like, oh, I'm Whoa, sad. Me, yeah. yeah. I'm like, <laughs> well, this, this sucks. Um, and, and you just, you move forward. And, you know, again, like going into my sophomore season, I was horrified. Cause I was like, I, first of all, I started mm -hmm. as a freshman. That's never guaranteed. <laughs> you know, I was like, I don't know who she's going to play. I don't know. Like, what I bring or how I fit into this new puzzle piece of, of players with freshmen coming in and, you know, all this stuff. Um, and so it's just, it's one of those things where it's just everything's so uncertain and you never know what you're going to get. But I, I think that like our, our current staff is just, they're, they're just far and away some of the best people that I've ever met in my life. And like, they're so dedicated to us as young women and like developing us as people that it makes the basketball just, you know, easy. Like, that's the easy part. Putting in the work, like, that's the easy part. And it's, like, those relationships that we now have with each other, just they fit in a way that I never thought I, I would get with another group of coaches. Um, so I've been, like, really incredibly blessed to have, you know, two sets of, of coaching staffs that have been, like, incredible. Yeah, and I know that at least on – from what it seems like on the – what you I, I honestly I, I don't even know if there's any statistics to back this up but usually I feel like when a head coach might leave there might be um, a certain amount of people who decide that they want to go and switch programs was that something that ever crossed your mind or were you always still just extremely focused on doing what you had to do here at Princeton yeah I never it's crazy because like everyone thinks about it you mm -hmm. know it's so easy to like stick your name in the transfer portal you know to just like feel out the waters and see like if there's a better place, but you know, it's, it's interesting because like, I always trusted like the process of Princeton um, in the sense that like, I knew that when I came here, I was going to stay here. 
because first of all, it was way too hard to get in here. <laughs> like yeah. I did way too much work <laughs> and stressed way too much uh -huh. um, to not finish my time here. Yep. One <laughs> and two, like I knew my whole team couldn't leave. Like that wasn't happening, and they're who I do it for. Mm -hmm. And so it's like. I knew that if I had my teammates, if I had the people that I, like, came in here, especially my class, like, if I had those people, like, you figure it out, mm -hmm. you know? So I never really thought about it. Okay. Well, yeah. And so we've covered that 27-1 and one season, and like we said, it got cut short because of COVID. Um, uh, right, so right before we started recording, you said that right after COVID, you started working on the podcast. Could you tell me, tell me about that? <laughs> yeah, crazy experience. No, um, I... I sort of, <laughs> so basically we went home and I think like everyone, I just didn't want to leave my room. Um, I was really sad and um, our coaches, first of all, I had to go to school on Zoom. Zoom University, horrendous. Yeah. I, just the other day, literally like a week ago, I sent someone a video because I was in a dance class that semester and I sent someone a video of myself and the whole class dancing on Zoom. And I was just <laughs> reflecting on it, thinking about how how that was even a real a re it, it, just looking back on it. It doesn't feel real right. to this day that we got sent home, everything on Zoom, dancing in front of my computer <laughs> screen at my home. Yeah, feel, all, all feels very weird. <laughs> yeah, no, like it literally like I just so I think I just like with that. I was just not in the mood. Like I think that I was just so easily agitated when I was home at like those first few weeks and our coaches were making us jump on calls with, you know, career development. Like <laughs> and I was like I was like, Are you you're joking right now? You're asking me to figure out something to do with my summer right now. And um I, I was I was like actually upset. I was like, I don't want to do anything this summer. Can you just like leave me be? Like I don't need experience. And they're like, this is such a unique time. Like you can show employers that you like can work through it first. I was like, people are dying. Like, Not now. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. People are dying. Like I understand this. Like whatever. But like this is like a literal like like this is a pandemic. We're yeah. in the pandemonium right now. Like yeah. this is like not acceptable. <laughs> anyway, so like basically I um. Talked to a bunch of people. I didn't want to do anything formal, um, but, you know, Frank Swinski, our, like, alumni guy who, like, puts us in contact with a bunch of different alums in different fields, he was like, just, like, figure it out. Like, find <laughs> something, you know. I'll put you in contact with this person, this person, this person. Um, and so then he ended up putting me in contact with Kareem Maddox, who is a men's basketball alum, um, and he, like, majored in history here, but, like, loved history. English? History? <laughs> one, one of the two. Uh, um, he majored in something here. And <laughs> basically, um, he's been working, like, on podcasts since he, like, graduated, essentially. And, like, he's still playing basketball, actually. He, like, does three-on-three -three FIBA stuff. Um, so he's actually really cool. But he is, like, he's had, like, 10 years of experience in podcasting. Um, and so I was just like, I don't want to do anything else. So, and I don't know how to podcast, but, like, let me do it. And so this was, like, a very, like ground level starting place like i if we were to see the whole project to fruition like i literally would have been like a co-producer on it because i like i helped from like square one but basically it was just um it was called olympic hopefuls like that was the idea and and the whole premise was to just like tell like untold stories of like olympic heroes and it's basically just like trying to excavate voices that like you don't normally get in the olympic story so we talked to what like one of the first black women to be on uh, an olympic basketball team um we talked to a um native american man who won uh the four thousand meter at the <laughs> olympics i'm he was so cool oh my god i wish i i talked to him but um anyways like we just we basically like we're trying to formulate those stories and so i you know conducted the interviews like I created the questions for the different people that we could get in contact with conducted interviews I had to do some you know some sort of producing so I had to learn a little bit um but I think like my favorite part was just like they were sort of like these narratives you know it wasn't as much like conversational podcasting as mm -hmm. it was just like telling these like really cool stories and having arcs and like writing those types of things so like it was super cool he actually I he is doing it but he's calling it something different and he's like like 
really professionally producing it. So <laughs> it like sounds really cool. Uh, but if you listen to like the first episode, I think I'm like a he mentions me. Okay. So, um, but yeah. So it was actually it was really interesting. I, I enjoyed it. And is is podcast in a space you feel like you will want to work in post grad in some in some fashion? I just feel like it's like a really interesting form of like media. Like I agree. <laughs> yeah, course, yeah. I agree. <laughs> I think it's like it, I really think it's super cool because there's so much that you can do with it. I think that like we look at you know the basic forms of like writing, and then you get you know your TV shows, and you get your your film, and all those things. But, like, podcasting is just, like, such an interesting way, f in my opinion, to, like, disseminate information and, like, how it's – I think it's becoming a, a really important tool in how we, like, actually communicate with each other and, like, you know, how we get out in important information. And it's, like, really accessible. Like, I think that's what's important about podcasting is how accessible it is. You just listen to two people talk about things. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more with you. I There's something about this medium specifically that I – it just works so well i like the idea that again even just as we're having this conversation right here there is no sort of need to like it, it's much easier to explain yourself and to have just well thought out responses and just really just get your message across mm -hmm. in a very i think convenient way i don't feel like any other medium really lends itself to this exact same sort of conversation where even there's just so many there's so many different routes you could take podcasts and you could do one that's more conversational like this you could do one that's more educational mm -hmm. honestly you could literally do whatever like genre i guess is i don't know if there's a better word mm -hmm. whatever like genre that you want to do you can do that through podcasting and that's just something that i think is is really cool i was just listening to a um jj reddick he is one, probably one of my favorite podcasts mm -hmm. and he was talking to Draymond Green about why because Draymond Green recently started a podcast also mm -hmm. and they were saying this exact same thing where it's like when they they both work in TV and they're like when you're in TV you don't there's like a producer in your ear the whole time you have to like say your, everything you want to say so concisely but when you're in podcasting you can just because there's no time restraints you can just let everything out you can really get yourself to be well explained when you're they were saying how when you're on TV sometimes like your words will get misconstrued because mm -hmm. you don't have the exact you don't have the time that you want to like right. draw out all your thoughts but in this space there really is no time constraints like we could go for hours and hours and hours yeah and there's just something really special about podcasting that again is a reason that i do it and i again this is something that i keep wrestling with myself i'm like how am i going to keep doing this post grad because i do enjoy it so much and mm. i need to figure that out but I will figure it out. But yes, podcasting is fantastic. So cool. And maybe we'll even we'll, maybe we'll join up one day. We'll you'll be. Well, let's start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> let's start our let's own podcast. <laughs> let's go. Jo what What did you say the alum's name was? Kareem Maddox. Kareem Maddox. Maybe he'll. Maybe he could just like pull and go. With I'm the texting flow. him right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Post guy is like go with the flow. He'll produce for the show. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I I agree. There is there is something special about podcasting, and I think because podcasting is a I think it's it's. I don't even think it is objective. It's like a new thing. Mm -hmm. It's only been around for the last 10 years, yeah. which when you look in the grand scheme of things, is a very, very yeah. new medium. So we are just scratching the surface of, I think, the extents the podcast can go. There's people who like, and I'm just going on a tangent here, but um, like Charlemagne the God and Kevin Hart, they just created this company that's like a, um, it's, it's like TV shows, but an audible version, which again, that doesn't really make sense. But it's, it's so, it's like, it's just um, like, the, it's, it's a podcast but instead of like the way you'll have like a tv show yeah and watch it it's the exact same thing but just for podcasting it's like the narration and you get told the story and you just get to sit there and listen I love that. which i think is dope and there's so many different avenues that you can take it mm. and then eventually maybe that'll turn get turned into an actual like on-screen project but there's just so many different routes you could take it. I love podcasting. Okay. I see, like, it's this is this is so fun to me. I'm so <laughs> glad that I started doing this. This yeah. is such a dope thing. But yes, podcasting, it's great. Um, but okay, <laughs> to, to sort of bring it back. So you said you worked on that right when you got sent home, or right when we got sent home. Essentially, like I worked on it through the summer, basically. Okay, and then you decide you're going to take a gap year. What went into that decision for you? I think I still have like, I like made this like really pretty like paper with like a pros and cons <laughs> list and i like put little pictures on it and i drew little ivy um i like i remember making it like what are the pros what are the cons um so much goes into that decision obviously um and i i think a lot of it depended on what the school year would look like whether we'd be in person 
whether I'd be able to work out if I was on campus, even if we didn't have a season. I think like even when I was making that list before I had to decide whether to take a gap year, like our season was still on the fence. It hadn't mm. been totally shut down yet. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was a huge decision. It like, I had to consider staying home, which I didn't know if I would love, like if that's what I really wanted to do, if that was the best place for me at that time. And like, and, and so, you know, it was like scary, not sleeping, trying to figure out what I was going to do. Um, and like, I'm, I'm incredibly lucky that like my family just like, listen to me talk for hours <laughs> and just like scenario one, scenario two, scenario three, like endlessly. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, I realized that I wanted to be here for as long as I could. And, um, I wanted two years with my coaching staff cause I, I just loved them so much. Um, and I wanted like two years of basketball here. I think that for me, I, I don't get comfortable easily and I didn't want to go and play in like another year somewhere else um and because it just didn't feel right to me um and so that was probably one of the biggest factors of like me choosing to take a gap year it was like I probably could have gone and you know had it you know grad school paid for by somebody and like went and play basketball and like uh, that'd be the case but you know I just uh, there was something unfinished that would have felt unfinished about you know not taking the gap year and like going somewhere else, you know, finishing my basketball career somewhere else, you know. Yeah, and um, what did you do with the gap year? Um, well, you know, I did a few things. <laughs> I <laughs> I tried to keep busy. Um, I did. I I had a few internships. Like I worked during the election. I worked um for Poll Hero. I, a lot of people on Princeton's campus did it, but like I basically like was a media person where I was like creating these videos to like give the step by step on how you like register to become a poll worker for so like young kids could like figure it out and so I like starred in these videos of myself <laughs> talking and I like edited them and that was like probably my main role um, but I was just like helping you know sort of formulate ideas on that and then I um, had a legal internship with a new non-for-profit that was made like in that year 2020 um it was called athletic blacks in sports and it was just you know this organization trying to uplift black athletes um but you know i did a lot of like statistical work where i was just like looking up researching doing stuff like that um what else did i do oh my god i was a cater waitress okay so <laughs> i worked that was the hardest part um so i basically like worked events at this like beachfront club okay Ooh. and yeah and i had to you know work like sweet 16s and weddings and bat mitzvahs and things like that and um because i was just like i have to make money like i can't like i can't not make money right now um and so that was hard and didn't love that <laughs> but um did make a good amount of money um trying to think what else i did i did some stuff in the spring uh, I worked out a lot. I was really focusing on me in the spring, <laughs> if I'm being honest. <laughs> Trying to get ready to be back. But, yeah, that's essentially it. And how do you – because, first of all, it sounds like you were involved in a lot over the course of that one year that, again, you took a gap year. And keeping in mind that, again, you're still a varsity athlete, got to stay basketball ready. How are you able to, to keep yourself motivated enough to even do things like – working out, going to shoot a basketball, just th those those little sorts of things that I imagine that over the course of that year, you probably don't have that much motivation to do. Oh, it was hard. <laughs> it was so hard. I, you know, I, again, I was also doing this stuff by myself, you know, like essentially because all of my athlete friends, all of my basketball friends were at school because like they were having seasons while I wasn't. So it wasn't even like I had any pals to like work out with. Um, and... It took a lot of, you know, just like, okay, just, I know you don't want to do it. Get out of bed. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, I know you don't want to do it. Just like, take off the covers. <laughs> Sounds um, like me at school this year. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like still me, but like now there's like consequences. Um, But my brothers were like so helpful because, um, you know, they, again, like they weren't having seasons. Like my, my older brother, he like lives in upstate New York while we're down on Long Island. So I didn't see him as much, but he's like a maniac and works out all the time and um, is like super intense. And so I think like any time that I was feeling like, oh, I don't want to lift weights today. I just can't 
bench any weight. I don't want to do it. He would just be like, stop, like <laughs> just, just sit down, <laughs> go, go lift some weights. And, um, and then my other brother, like my second oldest, he would help me with the basketball stuff. He's like seven feet tall. And so he would just like stand there and I'd shoot <laughs> over him and stuff. Um, so yeah, like, I think like they were like probably my biggest help in just like getting me outside the door, like out the door to the gym, like, and then I have trainers who, like, obviously I would be nowhere without. Like, my basketball trainers I've been with since I was, like, a baby. Like, I've I've known them forever. And so, like, they were they were really helping me try to, like, figure out what I need to work on. Like, what I needed to, like, perfect for the like, upcoming season. And I worked really, really hard um, with them. So, like, I without them I would be nowhere. And what do you think you were able to learn about yourself over the course of that time period from – being sent home to taking a gap year to eventually coming back to campus what didn't I learn about myself I like feel like I grew exponentially I think that was like and I talk about this like with my dad all the time but like I feel like I grew more in that short period than I've like grown in my whole life like (laughs) and I was forced to I was forced to like get outside my comfort zone and and connect with people that I didn't really know. And I was forced to do podcasting, which I didn't know how to do. And I was, you know, I was forced to be around people and like cater people. And I never did that. And it was just like, there were so many things that I did in that, you know, year and a half, almost two years that like, I was just like, you are made of so much more than like you think you are. And like, I, you know, I thought my boundary was here and it's really like, I haven't found it yet, you know? And it's like, those are the things that, like, you know, I learned about myself, and I learned how to be alone with myself. Like, I which is very, very important, I think. Yeah, I didn't know how to. You know, I, you know, you go to like high school, and then you're always with your friends, and then you go to college, and you're never like, I'm never by myself. I'm always with my teammates, or I'm always with like a group of friends, and then I'm always with my family, and then, and I think like figuring out like, you know, how to be by myself, and then also figure out like, what I what I believe in, and like what I feel like BSAC really brought me that it's like it helped me so much with my identity and like figuring out you know what I value most in my life and and things like that and so yeah like the year was just like boom 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 like just throwing out like lessons um, yeah 2020 was a year <laughs> yeah it was like it was the year <laughs> that was um, a year <laughs> so so yeah like I've, I've learned so much about myself since then and it, I feel like I'm kind of like only doing it more and more now because I realize what it feels like I feel like you know when you realize what growth feels like yeah I think that I'm just like kind of leaning into it more than I would have in the past and I I yes even for me I I relate to that so much where I over the course of the last four years especially year over year the same way you described your growth as exponential I also believe that the when I look back on who I was freshman fall and then (laughs) I fast forward to who I am now couldn't be more different people and that's such a beautiful thing i don't think there's anyone i don't think anyone comes to college and hopes that they stay who they are when like the like the way that they were the way they were when they came in jeez i can't talk (laughs) and i remember um even there was i forget what it was it might have been preview or whatever but i remember president eisgruber saying at this like sit down at this it was a conversation in richardson Mm -hmm. he said that college isn't supposed to be the most fun four years of your life it's supposed to be the most transformative four years of your life and i truly i i really i that really just stuck with me so much when he said it Mm -hmm. and i truly truly believe that these last four years have been so transformative for me in so many different ways yeah not only uh, personally but just even like looking at the way like my professional trajectory has changed from what it was when i thought what I thought I was going to do when I came in. Mm -hmm. It's just, I, I'm very appreciative of, of the last four years that I've had. And even COVID, especially kind of like you said, being able to be by yourself, which I think is very, very important. And I don't think it's something that enough people realize it is necessary. Yeah. Because again, there is, again, it's great to always have people that you can go to, but there is something, something very, very beautiful and something necessary about being able to just be by yourself and not needing to be around other people to just like sustain yourself and feel like that's what you need to keep going. Mm -hmm. Everyone I think needs to figure out how to exist by themselves. And then when you're able to do that, it becomes so much easier to then go out into the world and give the best version of yourself to everybody else that you're around. So yes, it's great that you were able to figure all that stuff out. 
over the course of the the pandemic which is even another thing where obviously the pandemic is was a horrible thing many lives lost but i think a lot of people would agree that they were able to like grow as people figure out and prioritize what exactly was important to them and just re reevaluate their whole lives in a way that makes them makes them more appreciative and would just like adjust the way that they decide they wanted to to keep going forward so that's one of those things where it's like in this very very negative situation mm. there at the same time is a positive and a, a an opportunity for growth and mm. learning and all that stuff so totally yeah 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 it's very <laughs> cool. I love what we're saying here. This exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so, okay, we've covered your sophomore season, um, COVID years, and now you're back on campus. You guys are – honestly, I want to rewind first because – so your freshman year, you guys – and I was looking at – I was – because, again, I do my research for these shows. Period. You guys started off, what was it, <laughs> one and seven your freshman year and then finished, like, 20 and 12. Something You guys started off poorly – Finished off very strong. Yeah. NCAA tournament appearance. Lost to Kentucky. I remember watching that game because oh. I'm always supporting from a distance. Ah, um, so that was that season. Great season. Mm. Co- sophomore year, like I said, 27 and one. No season last year. You guys are currently 20 and four and on track. Probably the favorites for the Ivy League. I don't think that's a crazy <laughs> thing to say. The favorites for the Ivy League. What exactly is the secret to the success of Princeton women's basketball? Oh my gosh. Um, defense uh, no, like, <laughs> like my coach is like right behind me like <laughs> pointing something at me um no I um <clears throat> I genuinely I think like defense is obviously like a part of it um I I'm I always try to like think about like what sets us apart and like what, what makes what we're doing so special and all sort of stuff but like again like I think there's just like this level of like respect there's this level of integrity like there's this level of love that exists within our program that I think shows when we play together um like people always ask me like what's my favorite part or like what are my favorite moments um and my favorite moments are like always without a doubt like when we get back into the locker room after like crushing some team (laughs) and we're just like laughing together and we're just like screaming and we're just like let's go like we just you know and we're and we're so happy for each other it's like those moments that like I I think I'll I'll always have because like frankly like I don't even remember our last game that well like I don't remember (laughs) like what I did or that missed defensive assignment that I had or things like that but we just we play so hard and we play for each other that I think that like every single one of us does it and it's like people are like, oh well, I know this player who plays really hard, and like she plays for her teammates. So it's like, okay, that's one person. Like <laughs> you need like one through sixteen yeah. to have that sort of mentality, and like that's what gets you far. And so I think that like for us, our success has just come out of buy-in of like everybody believing in what in, in what we do and like who we are. And it's like that's been the most incredible part about playing for Coach Ruby because I think that's what she does is she instills that confidence in us as players and in her as a coach. Um, and, and we just, we just love the shit out of each other. Yeah. Like, I just like, those are like my sisters. Like I, I'd walk through fire for them. Um, and so, I, and I don't think a lot of other programs can say that, you know, genuinely. Um, and so like, yeah, I think that's what makes us special. And like, that's what sets us apart. Yeah. And honestly, to me, the, I think the perfect word to describe everything you just said is like, culture it seems like there is a very persistent and strong culture Mm -hmm. in your program and how were you able how does that stay how how are you able to keep that continuity of culture despite all the different things that you've been through over the last four years because pandemic coaching change but at the same time the consistency is still there how are you able to have that that level of continuity as a as a program you know i think it's like it's interesting because you you sort of, as you grow as a player and then as you grow as a leader throughout your four years, it's like you just kind of learn from what you see before you. Um, and I think it's that paired with, you know, Coach Banghart, when she recruited me, she told me, and, like, I'll never forget, like, she, she says, like, I recruit your best friends. And, like, I think it's when you recruit like-minded people and you recruit people with similar values and similar standards that – 
at the end of the day, you keep recruiting, you keep recruiting year in, year out, those same values, those same standards, you're able to build that culture because you have people who think similarly um, and, and, and who want similar things. And so I think that for us, like, I built culture because of who I am, you know what I mean? And because of who the people I'm with are and like who we are together. And so it's like, that's how I think you sustain culture. And like, that's how you sort of go about winning is just like finding people who like want the same thing as you as bad as you want it, you know? Um, And so I think that, yeah, like culture is something that we're extremely proud of and like we don't take for granted and something that like we work on. It's not something that we have overnight. It's not something that, you know, is taken easily, um, but it's something that we're really proud of, you know? And you just described, or at least in a, in a, a few statements ago, how strongly you feel about your team, you love your team. Um, and so those team dynamics, how, if at all, were they affected during COVID? And would it, was it like a struggle to, to get things back to the level that you feel like they needed to be for you guys to be so successful as a, as a unit? Yeah, it was definitely weird. And like, I felt really distant from my teammates um, in COVID. And you know, there are some people that I talk to almost every day, and then there are some people I didn't talk to for a really long time, and and that was different because, like, again, like I'm used to talking to them every day, yeah. <laughs> and um and so yeah, it was definitely weird, and like I went out and saw Nina in California, um somewhere right before, like right before, like spring before we came back here, um and then I would, you know, we had some people living in New Jersey, um like a group that I I went and saw a few times, and like those were like short occurrences here and there but like we didn't really get to like see each other that often um and so it was really more than anything else it was like it was weird kind of establishing again like the basketball connection you know getting used to playing with each other again because it had been so long um but like when I when I came back and like I saw everyone and I gave everyone a big hug and we moved in and everything felt real again like, it was, like, no time had passed. You know, I think that's, like, you know, the sign of, like, good friends that, like, yeah. you know, you haven't seen each other in forever. You, you see each other, and it's, like, nothing ever happened, you know? And it's just, you pick up right where you left off. Amazing. I literally talked about that on the last episode that's coming out this coming Monday. Also, I forgot to say, and I, I'm, I'm such an idiot, this episode is being recorded on Friday, March 4th. But, yes, it's, <laughs> again, very important because the last episode we talked about how and the relationships that really matter, it doesn't matter how much, how long you might go without seeing them. Mm. The second you see them again, like, then it's just, like, pick back up and things are just the way that they're, that, the way that they're supposed to be. But, I mean, I just have to say, you, the woman, not you, well, yes, you are part of the team. The, one, <laughs> the women's basketball team Me. is one of my favorite teams on campus. Freshman year especially, mm. I... I can't, and we'll, honestly, this is a good transition. We're going to talk about this a little bit. I'm going to ask about this in like two seconds. But I felt like some teams on campus, they don't do a very good job of being as friendly with anyone outside their teams or outside of, or just non athletes. And I thought your team, especially, was just such a great group. You're, you're the OG 2022 women's basketball team some of the the best people ever shout out nina one of the homies yeah you guys are just very genuinely good people Mm -hmm. and that was just a very refreshing thing to see compared to some other teams who might not necessarily be as friendly and this i just said i say that to say you guys are amazing women's basketball (laughs) team one of my favorite teams and that perfectly transitions into the next thing that i wanted to talk about which is um what some might say is like a athlete versus non-athlete divide on campus. Um, from your perspective, do you think that is a divide that exists? Uh, yeah, 100%. Um, I think that, like, while I don't like that it exists, I think that it's honestly just, like, a natural part of, like, the ways in which, like, people are able to interact in college. Um, I Like, speaking from experience, like, I know that, like, it's tough to, you know, find time to, you know – you know, like have interactions that are like very natural, um, that don't exist within the scope of your sport. Um, and so it's just like, where does the time go? Like how, you know, I wake up, I go to class, I go to practice, I do work and sprinkle throughout the day and then I go to sleep. Um, and so, yeah, like, I think that for me, like 
I, I, I really don't like that that divide exists. And that was like one of the things like I talked about with BSAC is like I want to bridge the gap between like regular black students at Princeton and black student athletes because I think that like that strength and that community together would be like unstoppable. Um, but it's tough. It's tough to, you know, to have that interaction. But I also think that there are athletes that just like, like, okay, I have my team. Like, I'm good. Like, let's stop there. Like, stop while we're ahead. Then I also think that, you know, there are black students that don't necessarily understand the student athlete experience. And so I think there's just like a misunderstanding on both sides that just leads to this kind of rift that exists, you know. And that is a question that I had. Perfect. And now, I, everything's just transitioning perfectly into each other. <laughs> so but <laughs> what what about the varsity athlete experience? Um, do you think that other people, like the non-athlete students, don't necessarily appreciate? I mean, I think that it's like I don't even know if we understand fully how we do it. Like that's how hard it is. Yeah, I, I don't know how y'all do it. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 actually kind of crazy. Like what is asked of us. Um, so I think that like, you know, for me at least, like when people are like, oh, like why don't you have more friends or like why aren't you able to connect with more non athletes on campus? And I'm and I literally just like, I think to myself like I barely get my schoolwork done, and that's like. <laughs> That's how I always answer is that, like, I'm just – I have so many responsibilities, you know, with the team. Like, to create the team that we have, like, it takes time and love and effort. And, you know, we have so much going on. I I exist in so many different spaces that, like, I feel very pulled thin, pulled thin most of the year. You know, most of the time I feel like I just can't be everywhere enough or I'm not – enough for enough people and like all these things and so it's like my effort is always going to be there as far as like trying to reach out but it's like I don't think that the spaces exist right now for us to interact the way in which you want to interact like like make time for us to have these meetings with PBMA like let's make time to have these like meetings with PABW you know with the BSU like what I would happily go to those events if I could but I am like in practice sprinting up the court as we speak <laughs> and you're like and it's like I, I and I love that those events are happening and it's not to say that I don't want them to happen or whatever but I just think that it's just it's hard when those spaces aren't there you know like we were trying to figure out what BSAC could do for Black History Month and I was like oh like um what's it called the um What's the Center for Diversity and stuff? Carly Fields. Yes, Carly Calf. Fields. Yeah. Like, the CAF is having all these things, and we could go to none of them. Yeah. So it's like, okay, so, like, what do you do then? And so I just think that, like, there is just a lack of understanding. And then on top of that, like, people, I think non-athletes think we get some sort of benefit from being a student athlete. I think that's, like, one of the bis- biggest misconceptions that we have, like, we somehow get something for doing what we do. And frankly, I pay to go here. <laughs> like, I'm not like at Duke right now getting paid $10,000, like a $10,000 stipend to go spend on shoes. Like, I pay to go here. I spend all my time either in class or on a basketball court. I I am paying. Like, I am paying for my dues because I wanted this experience. Like, I'm not getting anything for it except for the experience and like and I and I gladly do it but I think that there's just this like misconception that like oh like the athletes are treated differently and like granted I I can't speak for every situation like I can't speak for every athlete for every sport for every situation like I'm sure athletes are getting out of shit all the time like whatever but like to on the whole make assumptions about athletes is just not fair cuz like there are people like me and like like my teammates who are trying to do shit sorry stuff the right way <laughs> you could curse it <laughs> like trying to do stuff the right way and it's just like oh my god like they're so like oh yeah just, like get whatever they want and uh, again one of the tiger confessions that i selected for later on kind of is again someone who is just coming out with these blatant assumptions about student athletes and i just wanted to i, I will i want to see how you're gonna react to it because again I agree with all the things that you're saying. I very much so understand how much of a struggle 
it is to balance the time that you have. I really don't even understand how y'all do it. I personally don't think I could do it because you guys are on top of the class schedules that you have, which again, we all go to Princeton. It is equally hard for Everyone. every single one of us, <laughs> yeah. no matter what your extracurriculars <laughs> exactly. are. Even if you're an athlete, it is equally hard. Yeah. And so thinking of, I think of like Max, who's a fellow neuroscience major, but also basketball. Like, I, I don't know how he does it. No, I, I could barely do it without any extracurriculars. Right. So I don't know how he does it. <laughs> and it, the way you guys work basically like two full-time jobs at the same time i respect it so much i fully couldn't do it and i don't again kind of like you said i don't think enough people appreciate how spread thin you guys are most of the time Mm -hmm. and if there was that just a little bit of understanding and like seeing your perspective about where you're coming from i think they would understand because even for me i when i was on the pbma board which i was um freshman sophomore year i was on it vp sophomore year Mm -hmm. that was one of our big things we're like why are none of the athletes coming to our events? Like, what's going on here? It's mm-hmm. like, why won't they? Like, why won't they come to our stuff? And then you just like take a second, go like, put yourself in their shoes. And I, both of my three of my roommates were athletes for sophomore year, and it was as simple as over one conversation that me like, bro, we literally don't have the time. Yeah, we're always tired. If we're not in practice, we gotta do homework. We always have stuff. We have meetings. We have this. We have lift. We have that. And the other. I'm like damn you're right selfishly i was like why don't you guys come to everything and then you take a step back you put yourself in their shoes and you're like you guys literally just don't have the time yeah. <laughs> so yeah again very much so respect every single ath- not every single one some of y'all <laughs> <laughs> i'm not speaking for every I'm athlete not, yeah. <laughs> no 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 i, I, some I joke, of them I joke. <laughs> yeah no but i do i do genuinely respect what you guys are all able to do because it's not easy and i don't think enough people appreciate the level of of difficulty and just time management and mm. all that that goes into being it's especially for a team like you guys who are a great team mm. nationally to be that great and at the same time be a princess student because yeah Crazy. it's not easy it is not easy <laughs> it's not easy and so yes that as again i feel like this the divide that exists it's always it's, it's it's probably always gonna be there yeah i, don't, I agree i don't because even this was another thing that was one of our one of the things we try to figure out like how do we exactly bridge right, this how gap do you fix it? because i think that the way i think um usually you come in freshman year and th- i think the gap is at its widest by yes. far yeah, yeah and then as you grow each like as you move over the years mm-hmm. it closes in a little bit yeah but then as each year comes in it, it's just like the same like repetitive cycle of like you come in gap is huge by the time you're senior it's closer mm-hmm. but then with each new class you just are back to square one so yeah. how do you fix these things who the fuck knows uh, i it's not me to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I, bridging the gap myself right now, so exactly, just let me be. Exactly. Um, but yeah, those are yes, okay. That's that's all I had about that. And now on to honestly, I was gonna say a more fun conversation, but honestly, <laughs> euphoria is just it's not fun. It's it's dark. I love talking it's, about this. It's a not yeah, euphoria is just a dark show. Yeah. But first quick, because I saw the reason I know you watched it, I saw you tweeted about the show during the finale. You something about like Zendaya singing some song at the end. Oh and yes. I, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so just be- First general question. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the show Euphoria? Oh, oh my God. Where do I even begin? Um I I love Euphoria and I enjoy Euphoria. And so I say I preface that because I know that Euphoria is not perfect. Um, yeah, Sam Levinson, do better. Yeah, he. I mean, there, <laughs> there are, there are gaping holes in understanding. Um, but I would say that, like, as someone who loves TV and film, um, and loves like every par- part of the process, from like the acting bit to the staging bit to the costuming to the cinematography of things, like, it's a beautiful show, and um, I think is very well made. I don't think the writing in season two is as great as, Not a, as season all. one. Yes. I um, agree. But I, I also just adore Zendaya and I just think that she is so multi-talented and I think that the way in which they're telling the story is new. I don't think the story itself is perfect the way it's constructed. Yeah, I agree. But I think 
the way they're trying to tell the story and how truthful it is is something that like resonated with me you know what I mean and I and so I think that like and the different tools they're using to like tell the story the different types of characters they're using like the arcs that they're giving those characters and like things like that like I think it is so entertaining and I think it tells us an important story you know what I mean and so like I just and I'm I'm liking the tweets. I like <laughs> so I so I followed after the first episode of the second season. I fell in love with Fez in a way that I had not loved Fez in Shut season up, one. Fez. Fez, yeah, he yes, he definitely had a significant growth, and I feel like a significant appeal to the yeah. audiences in mm-hmm. the second season as opposed to the first i agree a hundred percent shout out fexy we love fexy i <laughs> i just like i'm unwell like i like so i followed ingus cloud on twitter and he was like live streaming like like, like live tweeting sorry the first like few episodes and so i just found myself on like the euphoria side of twitter for like ever i'm still on it and i love it like this is where i want to live it's where i want to exist <laughs> um and so i was just liking his tweets like a bunch of his tweets i was retweeting a bunch of stuff and like i think like that's what's so interesting to me about euphoria is that you have with tv in general so there's so much commentary on it now with like having twitter and instagram and all these different platforms to like commentate on so many different aspects of the show i just think that like euphoria is just there's so much happening in it and I think that if you don't, like, have a, like, base level understanding of relationships and dynamics in, like, I don't want to say, like, a historical way. But, like, if you, like, look at, like, say, Zendaya's character, Rue, who's a mixed girl existing in a world with a bunch of white people. And, like, I shout out to Haley Colborn, who, like, I follow on TikTok. She made, like, a TikTok about how, like they didn't write race in like into it in a way that like kind of erases part of who Rue is as a character. Like they focus on her drug addiction, but they don't focus on the fact that like she's a biracial drug addict, which like has its own set of implications. You know what I mean? Um, So yeah, like I just think that like, there's just like so much to it and I love, it's beautiful. Like the just, there's certain tableaus in the show. Like the eye makeup is unreal. The nails, unreal like if you just look at like the the little details i think that's what sam levinson's good at the big scope thing <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah yeah there's gaping holes in his plot lines yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he leaves stuff unanswered but the minute details the but attention the to details he will so he, he will pay attention to yeah so i i just have to say i think euphoria is imperfect but like i will watch that show over again over and over again yes a few things that you mentioned um zendaya first one Lo- love her uh, she was my screens my my wallpaper on my phone for a long time so i got bullied out of taking it off because oh. my friends were like this is weird what are you doing i'm like guys i love yeah. this i love this woman let me do what i'm doing yeah. and i think that's a big reason that this show has the following that it does yeah. although for me it was interesting because every other role there's it's such a unique show unique role where it is just again she's a drug addict um it's it's a pretty dark show and so i came into it in with i came into it with every other role that she's played in in mind mm. and everything so much more lighter and mm-hmm. bubbly and then i came and i was like what the fuck did i get myself <laughs> into kind of kind of insane but she honestly is probably one of the reasons that i keep coming back to the show because i and i've thought about this a lot i don't know if i actually love the show because for me kind of like okay and this is one thing when it comes up in conversation everyone brings up like yes cinematography is great it's very well produced very well shot but i'm a big like i need the story to make sense yeah and for me there's so many parts about the way the show is written and even li- little things like sam levinson beefing with one of the actresses in real life and right. as a result oh, like yeah. basically just like removing a lot of her out of the show yeah i can't appreciate certain things like that happening Mm -hmm. and so i'm i always wrestle with myself i'm like do i actually really like this show or do i just keep watching it so i can keep up with the memes on twitter because like you said euphoria twitter twitter is twitter (laughs) euphoria Mm -hmm. twitter is 
amazing. Okay. The way after every single episode, I will be scrolling for at least an hour on Twitter, just Literally. going through the memes, going through the little stuff that was <laughs> missed, all the little details. Yeah. It is phenomenal. And I'm also at a point where I've been roped into Euphoria Twitter. Yeah. And a lot of my feed is just a bunch of memes about the show. But yeah, it is it is fantastic. And yeah, so Zendaya, amazing. Euphoria Twitter, amazing. A little bit of holes in the plot. Some stuff that, again, I hope that stuff will get revisited in season three because mm. some like someone like McKay, a character who yeah was in only the first episode of season two right and season one pretty prominent character has something pretty traumatic traumatic happen to him and then they yeah. just abandon that whole storyline i'm like guys th- we we want to see how this all comes full circle yeah and i think there's certain shows that do a very good job of leaving no detail unanswered and always revisiting everything yeah like a show like billions i don't know if you've watched it yeah. it's very good about that mm-hmm. it's it's a show about this guy who runs a hedge fund and there's some like um um like sec guy who's trying to like capture him the whole time but essentially i bring it up because again there everything that happens in the show every little detail is revisited in yeah. a way that just makes everything come so full circle and they leave no stone unturned yeah and i appreciate that and i don't think there's as much of that in euphoria yeah. but yeah i it again it's 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 a very popular show i think i saw this like the most tweeted about show ever yeah because it can imagine <laughs> yeah the involvement on twitter is actually ridiculous like yeah. every like when like an hour after each episode there'll be so many tweets about the show with like hundred thousand likes which is right. like not common that is like right. you, you never see that level of engagement about a show mm-hmm. so yeah obviously it's very very popular people love it but again sam levinson needs to get some help in the ro- in the writer's room yeah stop doing everything by himself because again you see it's like sam levinson creator showrunner producer it's like he does too much that's Wear, the problem wears it's, too many hats it's his baby like i think that's the pro i think that's a little bit like why i think that it, what's happening is happening because like it's his story through the vessel of like another character in a sense I feel like it's because, you know, it's his drug story. And, like, wow, I think that that's a perfectly fine way for an artist to, like, cope with, like, their trauma and, like, their experiences. Like, I think when you have too high a tight of a hold, like, you're not seeing empathically, like, everyone else's experiences in in a way that, like, actually necessitates, like, factual, like, human connection. Like, the way in which Rue would interact. Like, that whole... Anyways, like, I'm sorry. (laughs) Like, the relationship that Rue has to Ellie. Like, it's just, like, there's things like that that I'm just, like... And, like, I think that, like, one thing that the show does do well is the sort of delving into, like, the relationship with Rue and her sister and Rue and her mother and, like, the rawness of that and, like, the honesty of that. But, like, bro, like, what is... Like, what is this jeweled Elliot... Like, I'm sorry. Also, you wouldn't have a school play, first of all, with that budget. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just want to talk about, like, you would never have a school play with that budget. <laughs> and then on top of that, there's no way that all these adults in this room are just going to watch that girl walk up there in her heels and try to, like, ruin the play. That's the one thing about Euphoria. It is set in a high school. I've seen zero backpacks. Zero. I've seen zero homework being done. Yeah. I've seen zero teachers. I'm like, what exactly is this school? It re- it makes zero sense. I'm like, none of these people are on track to go to college. No. I don't know what they're gonna be doing Who with their lives. Trying to stay alive. That's like, it. <laughs> that's it. I have not seen anyone pick up one single pencil on literally, the show. So that that is also another part that's like hilarious because <laughs> every other high school based TV show it's like sex education even like a teen wolf in teen wolf they would show them in class yeah. very obscure show but yeah, yeah. i used no, to, I I used exactly to watch teen about. wolf they would show them in class they would <laughs> be doing homework and all that stuff euphoria is like nope forget all the school stuff no. there's just drugs sex alcohol literally that's it that's it they go to a carnival before they go to their freaking finals like they like they like are not what the heck oh uh, yes but again i'm glad that I've this is another thing, another topic that I've wanted to talk about, but I don't know who watches it. And I saw that you tweeted about it. I'm like, bet you for your talk. Oh, yeah. But we've already done an hour and three minutes. It always every single ah! I know it always it always flies by. And so I don't like to make these go too long. So I will now bring it to the song segment. OK. And so can you whip out your phone and pull out the the songs that I ask you to prepare? Mm-hmm. And this is a segment of the show that still has no name. 
it needs a name mm-hmm. theo we need a name this like it's gone on too name. long <laughs> the music identity segment is what i keep saying but yes okay so okay. as usual ask the guest to come up with five songs that describes who are they are who they are as a person i leave it very open-ended mm-hmm. um take it in whatever direction you want last guess she did like an acrostic of her name and his song for like each letter oh. so again do whatever you feel like but okay did not do all that, <laughs> I did not do song all that. number uno numero uno <laughs> okay so i'd like to preface this with i had no idea what to do <laughs> so i actually like I asked my brother, okay. my older brother, like what he would choose, like five songs to describe me because I was like real struggling, <laughs> like big struggling. And um, I really liked them and his reasoning for them. And I think they like reflect me well. Okay. I like, I, again, everyone does it their own way. I love this. Okay. Yeah. So I feel like I just took what he wanted, like what he said. Um, and they're pretty spot on. So my first one is um, Blackbird by okay. the Beatles. Um, I have a blackbird tattooed on my foot um, because like that song just holds a lot of meaning for me and it's essentially a bla- about black women um, and you know sort of it's you know it's sort of about how like the power that black women hold and how like we're restrained but we want to just be like set free and to live our lives and um, you know sort of like the kind of weird way in which we exist and I think that like as a black woman that like I identify with that a lot because I'm also mixed and it's like real complicated. And so I think that, yeah, that was, that's a big one for me. Um, and then my brother said, <clears throat> there's a song called don't sweat the technique. And it's like this rap song, but like by Razim and he was saying, how like, I've never even like, I listened to the f- song for the first time, like, <clears throat> excuse me, like literally like yesterday, but he was saying that like, it's how I play basketball. He was like, he basically Razim in the lyrics like literally tells him like you can't do it like me <laughs> he's like i can do this 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 and this and like you basically can't do it like me. love that <laughs> and so he's like that's kind of how you play basketball you can do all these things um <laughs> and so then the third song he chose was shop around by Smokey robinson and the miracles and he was like this one's like really like convoluted but he was like it's basically about this mother telling her son to like shop around like don't just like marry the first girl he meets or whatever and to like keep his standards high and stuff like that and he was like i just feel like you have really high standards and like (laughs) you don't just like let anybody like care about you and like you don't just like let anybody just like you don't just jump into things because just to jump into things you know you have like you know high standards when it comes to that and so i was like that's really nice i felt good about that one um and then the fourth one is um Anyone Who Knows What Love Is by Irma Thomas. I know it's a song that's like, anyone, anyone, you know. Okay, I know like, that song. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and he was, this one was really nice because he basically said that, like, I, like, I don't know how to describe what he said exactly, but he essentially said that, like, the song lyrics are, like, you, you don't understand, like, this love that I have or whatever for this particular person. It's like whatever and he basically said that like sometimes like people don't always get like how you're loving them like they because like sometimes my love can come across like gritty and like harsh or sometimes like aggressive or like whatever but like that like the way that I love people the people that I love understand it like they get it um and like that's what's important you know um and so I really like that because like some people really don't get when I show them like I'm like a tough love type of person Mm -hmm. like you know I, I tell people honestly how things are and i like hold people accountable for shit and like which is very important yeah so like i think people don't always understand the way in which i like show my love to people um so yeah that was nice too and then my last one he said a change is gonna come by sam cook because he was just like you're doing great things and you really want change and like you are change in some ways and you want to be that so yeah makes me think of you I love that so much. Again, you, everyone does it their own way. I love that you involved your brother. Yeah. You got to bond over this little song thing. It's uh, it's so nice. It was a, really nice. Uh, love that yeah. so much. Great segment. Uh, it's uh, it's so cute. It, no, it, 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 no, it really is. It, again, ev- literally every single person has done it their own way. Whether it's people just being like, my favorite song at the moment or um you talking to your brother or the acrostic just ev- it's it just it's leaves so much room for interpretation yeah and even the way you interpret it just shows a little bit about you also so mm. 
great, great segment. And now <laughs> we bring it to the very, very final segment, the Tiger Confession segment. Mm. Um, and so this first one, like I said, we touched about, upon this earlier, and this is essentially it has to do with assumptions that people make about athletes. And so mm. I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> and again, these are this person's words, not mine. Um, and so it, it's not even a question, just like I want to see like, reactions to it. Um, and it says, all of the athletes here are so damn conceited and <laughs> they didn't even spell the word right hilarious and it says look comma the only reason you're here is because your parents paid for your lessons in whatever rich person sport you play you could not have gotten in here on your own merit whoa <laughs> Egg, oh i know okay and thoughts that's spicy <laughs> very that spicy is, that is, wow i i okay well first of all <laughs> first of their all, words not mine <laughs> Rich is a stretch, I will say. <laughs> no. Um also like I had like my equipment consists of a basketball and sneakers. So I would say that um personally it's uh no rich person I, I I just can't imagine that it would cost that much for me to become good at basketball. But um yeah, I don't know. Like I think that like if that's what upsets me is that like that is a such a small like microcosm of like athlete that like i don't exist in that world whatsoever yet it's like these athletes are so conceited and it's like nope i'm, I'm actually <laughs> quite nice they, like, i can confirm grace is very nice yeah, yeah, I, like, I like when people talk to me like i like having conversations like i just it just doesn't make sense there's just like these you know sweeping statements about like who we are as athletes that are just like so false and like yeah what are you gonna do i can't convince you that i didn't play a rich person sport i didn't play squash i didn't golf i didn't sail like sailing's a rich person sport sailing is a rich person sport yes you need a whole boat for yeah. that <laughs> so like i will say that like i didn't do any of those things no and it, exactly and this is another one of those instances where people make generalizations about people that they have never even spoken a word to yeah and it says like wait, wait, i lost it it says your parents paid for your lessons in whatever rich person sport you play basketball soccer so many most <laughs> more oh. sports than not are not like in quotes rich person sports yeah. it doesn't do you any good to be making assumptions about like background how people got to where they are yeah. we've just spoke about how hard it is to do exactly to how hard it is to be a student athlete so yeah, yeah. People have way too many assumptions. Things, uh, mediums like this are necessary for people to be able to hear from a student athlete yeah. that you are just a very nice person <laughs> trying to get your homework done and win an NCAA Still title. And try, you're just doing Still your best. 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 And someone like this, I bet they have not really interacted with any student athletes. And so they just yeah. have this very strongly, wrongly opinionated, opinionated um, version of them in their heads. So, yes. Everyone needs to do a little bit better in branching out, reaching out, connecting these divides, and just getting to know people. And then you'll realize that a lot of these sweeping assumptions that you have are just not even in any way accurate. Literally. Literally. Okay. And the second one, and again, like it's it's been hard to find ones. I'm just, <laughs> I'm, yeah. Okay. I'm this okay. Uh, this one <laughs> says. Um, you would think that after all this, Princeton students would want to actually help society, but they are all interning with corrupt Congress members and senators. <laughs> oh, well, maybe the next generation <laughs> will do better. Thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot. Um, mm, wow. I, mm, I think that, like, that's also been, like, one thing that I've had to think about more in COVID because I'm, like, halfway through my Princeton journey. I was halfway through my Princeton journey at that point. And then you're like, oh, I got to be like an adult now. Like, what am I going to do after this? You know what I mean? And I didn't have any sort of like idea for my like professional career path. I still don't really. And I think that like, first of all, you have no idea the morals and values of a Princeton student. And it's not guaranteed that yours align with theirs. Like I'm, I know a lot of Princeton students that I have sat next to in class that I don't agree with at all about what they believe in. But I think that it's also fair to say that like, one, we have no experience, professional experience, really. We have whatever we did in our summers, which could be really good or like not that much. Like you don't know, it varies. And then it's like, okay, now go out into the world and like go pay taxes and like 
get a place to live and a car and health insurance. And like, so I think it's just like, it's unrealistic for people to be like, oh, like you don't want to see change. You're interning for this person. And it's like, I, again, I am doing my best. Like, I don't know what you want from me. Like, yes. Like you don't have to work for somebody whose values you don't like, you don't align with yours. And like, but I think there's like more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to change the world than just like, <clears throat> like protesting. I think protesting is great. I think it's incredible, but <clears throat> there's more than one way to do it. Yeah, and just I I will never understand the group of people who feel the need to judge whatever path or field that people decide yeah. that they want to go into. Actually, that is it. This again boils down to you never know someone's background. You never know how a certain opportunity might be changing their lives or what it might be doing for them. So I feel like people need to just mind their business, let people do whatever it is that they want to do. If you don't want to go work for some senator or do whatever, God bless you. Go do whatever it is that you want. go fulfill your purpose. Exactly. Exactly. Your purpose is not everybody else's purpose. And just because you see things a certain way doesn't mean everybody else needs to see it that same way. And so everybody, go into whatever field you want. Who cares? People are going to say you're like selling your soul or being a snake if you go into like finance. Like what? who, Who cares? Who cares? Do what you want to do. Go make some money if that's what you want to do. Go change the world if that's what you want to do. Who cares? Everybody just do you. Why are we so bothered about what everybody else is doing? So, yes, people, oh, there's, yeah, people are frustrating. Mm -hmm. But, again, I'm going to keep doing me, living my best life, and just doing what makes me happy without regard for whatever anybody else is saying good good I, you yes. should do that yes, How yes. Do you? thank you <laughs> um but we've wow our 15 minutes Woo. another phenomenal episode my first one as a solo artist being back independent i'm yeah. back in these independent streets it's okay. great i love it no, <laughs> not a part of the prince anymore things are great um but okay this has been phenomenal grace Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. I'm going to be at your game tonight. Good luck. Oh, thank you. And do you have any final words for the people? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> just <laughs> just uh, support women's sports. Support, support black women's women. Support women's sports. Yes, yes. Retweet. And everything retweet, you do. Retweet. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about the WNBA, but we don't have time. It's okay. That's okay. It's okay. Another podcast. Another podcast. When we start I mean, our own. Yeah, when we start our own. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When we work at this Princeton alum and do our own podcast, right, we'll, exactly. we'll make it happen. Right. But honestly, my final words, everybody do you. Mind your business more. Stop worrying about what everybody mm. else is doing and live your best life. Um, And that's it. This has been another episode of Go With The Flow. Thank you for listening.